Oh, well, welcome everybody and, uh, and thanks so much for coming. Um, I'm really grateful to Dominic for choosing this topic this year. As he, as he mentioned, um, bi is a, a massively neglected area um, in therapy and in the LGBT world more broadly. So it's amazing to have a whole day on this. Um, and as you mentioned, when we were choosing the title, I was quite reluctant to even put the by word in there because of our previous experience of low turnout at events on this topic. Um, pe people often feel like either bi is a tiny minority of people, so do they really need to know about it? Or they think because they already know enough about straight people and gay people, they can kind of add that together and that equals knowledge on bi people. <laughs> um, those are the reasons that I've come across. So we called it Beyond Gay and Straight, but it's important to remember that, um, that, that under most bi people's definitions of bisexuality, that's pretty much the same thing as calling it bisexuality, because most bi folk define bisexuality as attraction to more than one gender or attraction regardless of gender, um, so i.e. all sexualities that are somewhere between or beyond gay and straight um, could be called bisexuality. Uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. So just to um, start to kick off the day, I'm going to talk a bit, about, a bit more about definitions and also about the mental health issues uh, for bi, that bi people face. And a lot of this is drawn from the bisexuality report, which me and a group of other activists and academics put together back in 2012. So this is freely available online. If you Google bisexuality report, you can download this PDF. Um, and it's got a lot of in information, not targeted specifically at therapists, but in general. Um, and you'll see that Pink Therapy are one of the people who, uh, who sponsored the report. Um, the other thing that you might find useful is there's a chapter on bisexuality in this book that Christina Richards and I did <laughs> specifically aimed at therapists and other mental health professionals. Um, and if anyone can't afford the full book, I can easily s send you the, the chapter on bi in there. So that's got specific kind of guidelines for therapists, which I'm sure we'll be discussing over the day as well. So I'm going to draw on the, the report and that chapter um, in, in order to talk a bit about bisexuality and bi mental health. Um, so, why think about bi separately? Why have a whole day on bisexuality or beyond gay and straight? Um, well, first of all, bisexual people's experiences are sometimes, in fact, often different from those of straight and gay people, so we do need to think about them separately. I mean, I'm kind of preaching to the converted here because you've come to the conference, so I guess you're already on board, but here's some of my thinking of why it's important. Um, importantly, biphobia is distinct from homophobia. We see a lot these days of people kind of expanding out to talk about homophobia and transphobia, and every time those of us who are involved in bioactivism see that, we're like, Ah, it's homophobia, biphobia and transphobia. You know, biphobia is a different thing, as we will see. Um, and of course, a lot of bi people experience both homophobia and biphobia, and some also transphobia as well. Um, bisexual people face discrimination and prejudice still, sadly, from within both heterosexual and lesbian and gay communities. The bi activist Robin Oakes has called this double discrimination, and that's a real issue. So the, 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 this issue of having gone to straight community, whatever that means, gone to people in your life um, as a bi person and experienced prejudice and discrimination there, and then accessed LGBT um, community or support, hoping that it would be better and finding you're discriminated against there too. And that double whammy is one of the things I think that really takes a toll on bi people's um, levels of distress and mental health difficulties. And as Dominic already said, these are higher. Every study that's been done across many um, countries, Australia, Canada, UK, Europe, finds that if you look at, uh, if you tease it out, and if you look at bi people compared to straight and lesbian and gay people, they're higher on pretty much every measure of mental health difficulties. So that, thinking about why that might be is really what we're about here. But let's just touch on the, the definitions a little bit more before going further. Um, the dictionary definition of bisexual, bi bisexuality is still attraction to both men and women. And this is quite a contentious one because very few bi people use that definition themselves, although some do. Um, and also, there's a lot of kind of assumption that bisexuality only refers to kind of 50-50 people who are attracted to, you know, kind of 50-50 men and women. But actually, of course, it includes anyone who's attracted to more than one gender, uh, you know, even if there's, there's quite a lot more attraction to one or quite a lot more attraction to another. 
Um, it also encompasses people who experience their sexual identity as fluid and changeable over time, which is a lot of people. Lisa Diamond's research in the States has found that a lot of people shift the, the words they use for their sexuality and their experience of their sexuality over time. Um, so it would include sexual fluidity. And as I said, people who are attracted to people regardless of gender. So for a lot of us, sex, the gender of a partner isn't the most significant thing about our sexuality. Um, it might be something else we're going to hear from ZK later about kink, for example. For a lot of kink people, it may be their kink identity or position that is more important than the gender of the people that they're playing with. Um, for some in the asexual communities, it's about the level of desire they experience far more than the gender of a partner. Um, so that's worth really thinking about as, as an, under that bisexual umbrella we're going to look at in a sec. Um, so there gets to be quite a discussion between bisexual and pansexual or bisexual and queer people around this whole but bi means two genders thing and I just kind of want to blow that out of the water before we go any further <laughs> because um, most people who identify as bi don't think of bi meaning men and women, don't think of it implying a two. Um, Shiri Eisner, who's a really important bi activist whose book's terrific, um, says you could take the bi to mean attraction to the same gender as me and attraction to other genders although I'm never quite sure what the same gender as me would look like. I'm, I'm still keen to meet that <laughs> person. <laughs> um, my, uh, my pal Jen Yockney, who's a really important UK bi activist, says to think of the bi and bisexuality implying two genders in the same way that strawberries are made of straw. <laughs> so good. <laughs> That's the, that's the first of two Jenny Ockney gags I'm going to use today. <laughs> so this is Shiri's bisexual umbrella, which kind of, again, gets into this expansion out of what we're talking about here. I'm not going to go through it all, but um, if we think of bisexual, bisexuality broadly as attraction to more than one gender, then we could also include under it pansexual, omnisexual, polysexual, queer, fluid, homoflexible, lesbiflexible, heteroflexible, bi-curious, and any manner of other bi-identities. Um, so it's a big umbrella with, with a lot of people underneath it. However, of course, you shouldn't use the word bisexual for anyone who prefers other terminology. That's really important. But the aversion to the word bisexual might, with clients, deserve a little bit of unpacking because it can be due to, um, to this kind of cultural biphobia, uh, which people will be kind of immersed in. Um, and uh, it does seem with younger folk, the Metro Youth Chances study found that a lot of younger folk were using more like pansexual or fluid or queer rather than bisexual and rather than kind of lesbian and gay as well. Um, so under this umbrella, we might also put the guys that Charles is going to be talking about if they experience any attraction to their wives and they're also having relationships with guys. Also, we might put the queers who that uh, Amanda and I will be talking about this afternoon. Anyone who's not strictly attracted to one and only one gender. And also we could start to unpack what we mean by gender, but then we'll be here all day. But like, you know, are we talking about attraction in terms of sex, biological sex? Again, we can question what that means. Is it about whether attracted to male people, female people, intersex people? Is it about whether attracted to masculinity or femininity or androgyny? You know, what are we talking about when we talk about one gender or more than one gender? You might think to yourself, if you're own, you know, are you only attracted to feminine women or masculine men? What do you mean by those terms? And under that kind of definition, we're really kind of expanding out to a lot of people, I think, under bisexuality. This is a useful diagram that my colleague Rebecca Jones came up with. So in terms of numbers... You can imagine a further little, little circle right inside the bi-identity one. So that would be bi-community. So the people we actually tend to hear from, the bi-activists and the bi-community, well, you could say that's as small even as 200 to 300 people in the UK who attend the annual BiCon event. Or you could say it's the few thousand people who are on actual bi-meetup groups um, online. Um, but then by identity, obviously, it's going to be bigger than that. It's going to be more people who see themselves as bi than who engage in community. Um, so that might be, according to the big US study, about 3 to 5% of people identify as bi, compared to about 1 to 3% of people as lesbian and gay. So already the, the bi group is bigger, actually, than lesbian and gay. Um, and then you get to behaviour. So how many, give, given the level of cultural biphobia, how many people are behaving in what you might see as a bisexual way without actually calling themselves bisexual? And this is where we get to the Kinsey scale, right? So the scale from zero being exclusively heterosexual to six being exclusively <coughs> homosexual. 
and you could say, well, anyone in between the zero and the six would count as bisexual. Sometimes people quibble over that, but this is my second Jen Yockney phrase that I came across. Um, and she said at a recent thing that if, you, um, if you're somewhere between Dover and Calais, you are going to get wet. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so YouGov helpfully did a, did a poll quite, quite recently using the Kinsey scale to find out where British people sat on that scale and found that about 19% chose something other than 0 and 6 and about 43% of 18 to 24 year olds chose something other than 0 and 6. So we're talking about nearly the majority of people by that. Um, it's got quite unclear, though, whether they were taking the Kinsey scale to mean experience, as in having done things, or attraction. I think probably those people were talking about attraction, but it's a little bit hard to tell from the way they worded the question. But probably attraction is going to be even bigger than behaviour. And another thing to throw into the mix is um, Jane Ward's recent research, which is in her book Not Gay, Sex Between Straight White Men. So she's finding a lot of people, who are, men who identify as straight, are having same-sex sexual experiences, like bro jobs is uh, one of the phrases. Um, <coughs> so where would they sit in there? You know, they're not bi-identified. They're doing something that looks like bi, bi behaviour, but they're very strongly saying that they're straight. So, and, and I guess the kind of whole bi-curiosity in women thing that's been maybe written about for longer is another thing to, to see in that kind of, in, under the umbrella. OK, so to get on to the mental health stuff, we've, we'll come back to the kind of figures on that. But um, in terms of what's causing it, it's hard to do a study that finds very clearly why is it that bi people are experiencing more mental health problems. But I think you can kind of put two and two together and assume that it's about cultural biphobia. So just to go through some of the, the elements of that with you. Um, that despite the fact that we're seeing at, at least a significant minority, if not a majority of people are bisexual or are attracted to more than one gender, um, there's still this really strong f force in the, in the wider culture to get people into the two boxes, to, to erase anybody who doesn't fit into this gay-straight binary. It's still very strong. So one way that um, exists is in denial of the existence of bi bisexuality, um, the kind of it's just a phase on the way to a mature gay or straight identity idea, which has been pre prevalent in therapy. Um, uh, actually, just as many people go from um, go from gay or heterosexual to bi as go from bi to gay or heterosexual, and it's important to remember that you know all of these sexualities can be a phase on the way to something else. And again, why would why is that so bad? Why is seeing something as a phase really a problem? Um, even in the 2000s, research trying to prove the non-existence of bisexual men happened. It is worth looking that up because it is just so... The, how they did that study was just so weird, um, showing, showing guys porn and seeing whether their penises responded to the porn and how, how they went about this. Um, but it got reported in the New York Times under the title Gay, Straight or Lying, you know. And for years, bi men in the States and elsewhere were living with that representation that they simply didn't exist, that they were, they were lying about their sexuality. Um, they repl replicated the study and found that there were plenty of bi men, but you know, the damage had been done by this point. Also think about when Tom Daly came out and he, he talked about, well, you know, I've always been attracted to women, but now I'm in a relationship with a guy, and instantly the gay press was like, Tom Daly is gay. You know, it's re really problematic. Um, so there's a lot of invisibility or erasure, assuming that people are either lesbian, gay or straight um, on the basis often of their current partner. And so you see this in soap operas when somebody goes from being attracted or being in relationships with women to being in relationships with men. It's like, well, they must be gay. Um, or Brokeback Mountain, all the press around that was like, it's a gay cowboy movie. And a lot of us by activists were like, no, it's a bisexual shepherd movie. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get it right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, then there's the exclusion um, and marginalisation and the neglecting of bi issues in LGBT organisations and prioritising of lesbian and gay issues. Um, and this is something that comes up a lot. I mean, I've talked a lot to the people who are doing kind of these mental health studies in, in the UK and, and, and studies on um, LGBT youth. And what I keep saying to them is you need to tease apart by experience because it is different. And it's really hard to get that message across to researchers and to LGBT organisations um, to, to actually do that. So still they're not really doing that. But, and the problem with that is then you get these findings that say, oh, LGBT, LGB people have worse mental health than straight people. People. 
And then if the government does anything about that, which you know we hope they might, maybe they won't, but if they did, it might be that they send resources then to the gay community or the gay scene. But actually, it's the bias statistics that are bringing the numbers down, but the help does not get to the people who most need it because they've kept LGB together rather than teasing it B apart from LG. And this is really still going on. It's really hard to get that message through. And finally, of course, you've got negative stereotypes of bi people as greedy, threats to relationships, spreaders of disease, fence sitters, etc. And even the most recent media depictions tend to, you know, they're a bit more positive. We've got people like Captain Jack from Doctor Who and Torchwood and uh, arguably Frank Underwood from House of Cards, which I'm enjoying at the moment. But, uh, but they're always, you know, suspicious, evil, dodgy characters in some way. You know, they're, they're very rarely, yeah, just positive. Um, so yeah, we think that definitely all of this takes a toll on bi people's mental health. How does it play out in the everyday lives of bi people? It's a build up of microaggressions, that idea that I'm sure you've come across. The, the everyday kind of sexual harassment of bi women, assuming that they're you know, up for being you know, sex talked about sexually or that they're more available than other women. Um, the questioning of sexuality, particularly of bi men, but also other bi people. Um, the sense of exclusion from LG and LGBT spaces and also just having to come out repeatedly and how wearing that can be. You know, you've come out to somebody as bi and then they're talking about you as if you're gay and you have to like come out again and kind of keep explaining that it's not the same thing and a lot of people find that really tiring. Um, or they're assumed to be straight and that can really take a toll if somebody is in a relationship that's perceived to be a straight relationship but they're bi. Um, and having to kind of keep deciding whether you're going to make a point of saying that or are you just going to... And often, you know, still people's partners, if the partners are lesbian or gay or straight, uh, are sometimes averse to their partners being open about being bi because of the kind of prejudices and discrimination that they will experience or the idea that, that person's bound to leave them um, at some point, etc. So it's that kind of real everyday stuff that bi people talk about taking a toll, really grinding them down over time. Um, and so that's, we're talking about depression, anxiety, self-harm, suicide, also in some studies more likely to have substance abuse issues um, and less likely to seek help for both mental and physical health problems. So the, the, the studies are out there that find that bi people, when they do go to therapists, quite often experience further biphobia, um, especially of the kind of, you know, you must really be gay or straight. So when it came to the conversion therapy stuff that Dominic's been so involved with, you know, I was saying it's really important to highlight bi's experience because some bi people even go to lesbian and gay therapists and find that they're being encouraged to embrace you know, something that looks like gay affirmative therapy can actually be really bi non-affirmative. So we must remember to keep open all the options for our clients, um, especially when they're living in this biphobic society. So they may need extra weight from the expert therapist to kind of counterbalance that and say, look, this really is um, a real identity that you can have and also there is support. So just to finish up, it's not all doom and gloom and it's really important not to paint by people as total victims. That's, not, that's pretty disempowering as well. So there was a great study recently that's reported in the Bi Report about positive experiences of people being bi. And bi people in that study spoke about being free from these social binaries um, of lesbian, gay or straight. Um, also being able to form relationships with less restriction around who they could be attracted to. A sense of independence, self-awareness, authenticity and resilience. Um, maybe more appreciation of others' diversity and difference. Um, this was a really interesting one. We can reframe fence sitter as bridge builder. You know, we can think of bi people who often have experiences of both, uh, of both privilege and oppression and actually are very useful people, therefore, to talk about the experience of being on both sides of that kind of dynamic. And also people talk about a strong sense of community, volunteering and activism. Uh, so um, a friend of mine, Helen bowes catton uh, did some research where bi people talked about the vital importance of bi community spaces as somewhere they could breathe and feel at home and kind of get a bit of energy back after living in this kind of toxic culture every day. So some quick recommendations, and we'll keep talking about these over the, over the week, but don't drop the B. <laughs> Think about biphobia as well as homophobia and transphobia. Consult and include bi people in LGBT work, support by events and spaces, and don't assume one unified by experience. We're going to talk a lot today about intersectionality because it plays out very differently depending on race, class, gender, um, geographic location, age, etc. And that's really important. 
And just to finish, I'll leave this up. There's lots of resources out there. There's lots of bio community and bioactivism in the UK that you can be drawing on lots of organisations. So, you know, please, please do look into these if you want to find out more, especially if you've got clients who are looking for more supportive spaces. They are there. They're just not that loud. Thank you. Thank you.